Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry about the uh, glitch that we have here um, on our my computer, so you won't be able to see me. But um, I'll be uh, 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 continuing to moderate this. So I'm Dr. Karen Jaffe. I am a member of the Michael J. Fox Foundation Patient Council, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I am a retired OBGYN, and I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease 15 years ago um, at age 46. Currently, I'm a proud co-founder of InMotion, an amazing wellness center in Cleveland for people with Parkinson's disease and their families. Today, our panelists will discuss the many sleep issues that can come along with aging as well as with Parkinson's disease, including acting out dreams while asleep. We'll share tips for managing sleep problems and cover research into the latest treatments for sleep problems. Let me take care of a few housekeeping issues, though. If you have a question, you can type it in the question and answer box near the middle of your screen. Fox Foundation staff and our panelists will get to as many as we can. And if you want other helpful information or want to download the slides, check the resource list that's on your screen. We now have captioning available for webinars. To put on captions in English, please click the CC button on the bottom right of the media player on your screen. We've got lots to discuss, so let's get started. But let me first introduce our panelists. Dr. Kirsty Anderson is a consultant neurologist specializing in sleep disorders in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. She also is a clinical researcher studying sleep and how it impacts mental health and aging. We also have Otis Peoples, who is a retired police sergeant based in Chicago. He's now a behavioral health therapist. He was diagnosed with REM sleep behavior disorder many years ago, and we'll be talking about that um, directly uh, in a few more um, minutes. Last but not least, we have Linda Peoples, Otis's wife. She's a payroll administrator at the City of Chicago Department of Finance. The next slide, please. So, Dr. Anderson, before we dive into the specific topics listed here, can you help us all understand why getting a good night's sleep, which is something that we all want and need, can be so elusive for so many people, regardless of whether or not they even have Parkinson's disease? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, sleep problems of any type are just common. We think about the sleep we had when we were 18 or 19 or 20, and it's set up pretty well then. We get a solid chunk of hours. We don't wake very much. And we really have a rock-solid body clock as well, a circadian rhythm. We are hardwired to light. You know, we, we have been designed to be awake when it's light and to be asleep when it's dark at night. So if you think about modern life, there's a huge amount of things that are out there to disrupt sleep. The commonest cause of feeling sleepy is really simple, not enough hours in bed at night. There's lots of things around work patterns and shifts, but also we don't go out much now. Most of our work, most of our jobs take us inside for lots of people. So it's not just that the environment tends to be difficult for sleep. It's also the fact that there's lots and lots of different things that can disrupt the sleep. You've got a nice list there. You've got people not getting through the day without napping. That's actually really different to being agitated about not being able to sleep at night. That's insomnia. You've got people who wriggle and jiggle and can't keep their legs still, and that kicks into the night. And then you've got the fact that a lot of us, as we get a little older, weigh a little more than we'd like to, and the combination of getting a bit older and putting a little bit of weight around the neck can often make that snoring get louder and louder until actually the warning sign is the airway just collapses under the pressure and there's no noise at all. You stop breathing, your brain jolts you awake, and that's sleep apnea. And that's just really common. We have great treatments, but lots of people don't know they have it. So there's all sorts of things out there that can really stop you getting a restful night. Well, um, in terms of Parkinson's disease, does having Parkinson's disease make it harder for people uh, to respond to treatments that might otherwise get them back to a normal sleep pattern? So I wouldn't say so, actually. Um, so one of the big risk factors we know for Parkinson's disease and lots of neurodegenerative conditions is age. You know, we, we know that you're a little more likely to get this with every decade that passes. And so we really have to think hard about what's normal aging change for sleep. And then you just have to look at the person in front of you and work out what's wrong with their sleep. There's certainly some sleep disorders that are very strongly associated with Parkinson's disease. In fact, some of them can be much more of a problem for the person you sleep with than, than for you. 
But I would say that we've got really good treatments for sleep disorders. You just have to stand back, move away from the daytime disease and tune into the night and pick out what the individual problems are. Is there is there a situation where as people get older they need less sleep? And that they just they're not they, they think they have a sleep problem because they're not sleeping eight hours a day, but maybe they need less sleep than that. Ah, that's a great question. I always say the same thing to my medical students. You know, sleep, you think about ages and stages. If you say how much sleep do you need, well, that's like, you know, what's your shoe size? It's whatever's comfortable for you. Um, so when you are 19 or 20, if you leave people to sleep, and that's a good idea, teenagers are grumpy in the mornings, you know, they, they will sleep eight, nine, 10 hours as normal. If you look at someone fit and well without many medical problems they see their doctor with at the age of 60 or 65, and we've studied big populations, you're looking at about six, six and a half hours sleep. You may be in the bed longer, but in terms of what we measure, we'd expect the total amount of sleep time to decrease over time, certainly from the mid 30s onwards. Um, you also, your body clock changes. You tend to be a bit more comfortable waking up earlier when you're older, and on balance, you are a bit more comfortable going to bed later and getting up later when you're younger, certainly below the age of 25. So you have to think about the hours and the clocks depending on, on how old you are. Well, it's good to know because I think we, this eight hours is what we always, is the benchmark, and maybe some people are feeling like they're short on sleep when um, they feel fine during the day, they just don't get those eight hours. So. Um, this Absolutely. is a good um, time for me to remind people that um, you'll see on your slide that there's a sleep and Parkinson's disease um, publication that the Fox Foundation puts out. And this has this can answer a lot of your questions about the different um, topics that we talk about today uh, and go into a little bit more detail about some of the specific sleep disorder issues that uh, people with Parkinson's have. Um, next slide, please. So, um, Otis, you were diagnosed with REM sleep behavior disorders, I think, in 2011, but you have not been given a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Is that correct? No. I had, uh, from what the doctor told me, I had characteristics of it, but it wasn't Parkinson's. It was not Parkinson's. So, Linda, why don't you start us off with your experience as it relates to Otis exhibiting sleep issues and then how you got to the root of his condition with the diagnosis of REM sleep behavior disorder? Okay, how we got here. Um, well, how did you, you, yeah, you, you told us the other day and, and what, what you were noticing first. Okay, what I was noticing first was um, his dreaming. Uh, he dreamed every night and um, they became violent. At some, at some point, I just said he dreams a lot and he moves a lot. Um, but it got to the point where it has started getting dangerous for me because he 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 likes to dream, so he says. But he has like like he's at the show or something at the movies while he's dreaming, and he's enacting whatever he's dreaming. And so a lot of times he would be fighting. So as a result, I would uh, get hit, and also just strange things. Sometimes I would find him sitting up, and he'd be driving a car. You know, what is he doing? Or either the sheets would be, the covers would be moving and he's running somewhere while he's dreaming. But it got to the point where it was so violent that, um, like I said, for me and for him, because at one point he jumped out of the bed and um, hit the wall with his head. And I was like, let's see if he's okay first. And um, I knew it was getting dangerous. And um, when... I saw something on a, a news program about REM sleep, and it was a lady who was acting out as well. She would she had imagined herself as a tiger or something, and she jumped out of the bed and damaged. She she injured herself so badly, and I was like, that sounds like what Otis may have. So they gave a doctor's name, and we uh, called and made an appointment. And so they did a sleep study on him. And then, cause he of course just thought he was dreaming, but the doctor then told him that he did everything that I said he was doing while he was asleep. But it became dangerous because uh, he fell out the bed and broke his toe one time. 
-hmm. And it just got scary because we would move uh, the nightstand out the way, things like that that might injure him. So that's how so, we're here so far. So how long did it, how many was it years that he experienced these bad dreams, these, this dreaming acting out um, before you realized it was a medical problem? Yes, because a lot of people would tell me because I would tell people he, you know, if something happened to me, you know, go testify for him because <laughs> <laughs> he'd be dreaming. <laughs> but, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he just it, it got to the point where um, it was years, like I said before, we took it very seriously. So he started like really injuring himself and me as a result. Wow, but it didn't take him long to give him a diagnosis, now did it? No, it was right away. So Dr. Anderson, I've heard it said that REM sleep behavior disorder is presumed to be Parkinson's disease until proven otherwise. Although we now know that Otis has not been given a Parkinson's diagnosis, please talk about RBD, how it, why it happens and how it relates to simply a Parkinson's disease. And is it one of those non-motor symptoms that we can see begin years before someone gets diagnosed with TV, like we see with the other things like constipation? So th that's a great question. So you first of all said, is REM sleep behavior disorder, you know, Parkinson's until proven otherwise? Well, no, of course not, because there's a, there's a good um, saying in medicine, never say never and never say always, you know. Um, so you, we've heard a lovely story. And if I was sitting, you know, as your sleep doctor, I'd be diving into the detail there, going right <laughs> back to when the very first time he just starts to shout out and what almost everybody tells me is this beautiful story that you tell me i say the same thing long marriages they're great for sleep clinics then i get all the detail so can i go right back how far back do you think when he first started to sort of make a noise shout or just <laughs> the occasional how many years back did that go one well is it really We've been married for like 41 years. So Good. it goes back even to, to then when I think about it, I just thought, you know, okay. he's hollering. He's like, he's in the cowboy shoot him up with sound effects and everything. Yeah. So what almost everybody says is there's a creep on this. Then maybe it's once a month, there's a big movement, then maybe once a week, and then maybe two or three times a week. And then as you said, it gets bigger and more violent. And loads of people tell me that there's, there's nice dreams as well, like driving the car, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the big fighting ones are the ones that get in everyone's in trouble. So the first thing to say is this is common. You know, I, I tell people you are not alone and there's no testifying on witness stands because it's not your fault, Otis. That's mm -hmm. really important to say. This is, this is, this is not associated with being violent during the day. This is a common problem. This is out there in half a percent or one percent of men or women. But you know what? Guys are stronger. So when men hit, there's, there's more bruising. So we certainly see more men in the clinic. This is a slowly progressive problem, as people describe it, but months and years. So I can just about beat your record with um, a 40 year marriage. Um, so my longest story is, is 56 years for somebody very slowly getting worse. Mm -hmm. But if you take it the other way, you can't get past the fact there is a risk that it will be your early warning symptom for Parkinson's. And people know that and they Google it. So I say the same thing to everyone. I say, look, first, I'm going to treat you. And I'm really interested to hear what you what you started to fix this. I would I would think that there's often good treatment. But then I'm going to keep in touch, because even if you've got no problems, mm -hmm. if this is an early warning symptom, I want to be on it. But the big research shows that about maybe seven percent a year of people if we follow them up every year start to develop other trouble but it's not everybody the longest studies out there would say that maybe 12 years down the line more people than not have developed another neurological problem but there's people with a long history and i've been in practice 20 years and we're still meeting and they're still fine so you don't say never or always if that answers your question karen Sure, it does. Uh, I, there's a couple of questions from the audience who are asking, how can I help prevent my mother from acting out dreams? And how can I help myself understand I'm dreaming when I act out dreams because they live alone um, or they're, they're, yeah. they, they live on a floor by themselves? Yeah. So how can you help someone? We, we've, alre we've already heard 
from the guys here. You can go as, about as far as you can throw yourself. So really simple things. You move the sharp stuff and the nice stuff out of the way. You look, you look at how far a hand can go. And there's some very simple safety measures where you make sure things around you are soft. Um, that's a small, but it's an important practical point, isn't it? And if you go away on, on holiday or to a hotel, I bet you both look around and think where the sharp edges are. Yeah, both nodding. Okay. There's medication that can definitely help once the diagnosis has been confirmed. So we've heard about that sleep study. That's necessary. Um, and so that's going to be something you're going to discuss with your sleep specialist. Uh, I think it's a really good question of how do you know if you, if you live and sleep alone? I'd probably ask you, Otis, did you remember some of these dreams? Could, when you were woken, could you tell that the dream was coming with the ouch moment? You could see it at times. As, as, as it progressed, as you said, it, get, it was more frequent after a while. When I was younger, as I look back at my history, uh, it would happen periodically. But yeah. as I got older, it was more vivid, uh, more frequent. And you can tell, I, I woke up from a dream and lay back down and go right back into the same dream. Yeah, exactly. So the point is, if I'd seen you on your own, mm -hmm. you still would have told me about a dream that was memorable as well as the injury. So what you're really asking me is, you know, could it be any other type of nighttime event if there's an injury or fall or someone lands in a heap? Well, I think if we're thinking about the, the other problems that cause trouble at night that I see is like, seizures they often come with very different symptoms so most people if you talk to them although their their, their wife or, or their bed partner may remember more they will still be able to tell you about the dream narrative and that's often what makes you realize it's REM sleep behavior disorder is somebody's asked me in the audience whether it's wise to wake up a person when they're acting out the dream as long as you keep out of their way if they're okay. swinging a fist okay yeah. so there's two things there there's an old, yeah, okay. So we've got some, some wise bed partner answer that one. But two things. There's a myth. It is dangerous to wake a sleepwalker. So sleepwalking is different. That comes out of non-dream sleep. Now, the point about sleepwalking is actually um, you're, you're quite a long way from wake. It can take several minutes to come around. We've already heard from the guys here that... Actually, you can pop out of the dream and go straight back to sleep. It's really characteristic for RBD, for REM sleep behavior disorder, that you're quite easy to, to wake. And, and again, I'd really like your perspective on, I think you've both been managing this for some time, haven't you? You would, you would move out of his way, and you'd turn him out of the way, or would, would you think he was easy to negotiate with, to talk to at, at night, if he had one of these things? Well, it depends, like when he's in it, I can kind of tell yeah. what he's escalating and it, 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 yeah. it seems like it's getting dangerous. So I will try to, you know, I've learned not to touch him as much, but my voice, I'll uh, just try to wake him like that and try yeah. to, because he'll be rolling towards the edge of the bed where he's about to fall out. And I'm like, you, you know, I had to try to stop him at some point. So usually yeah. if, if, I, if I'm speaking, then he'll, you know, speaking loudly, he'll yeah. uh, wake up. Exactly. Know? So you've, you've worked out the solution yourself and you've given us the answer. That's exactly right. Bed partners get really good at the build-up going, trouble's coming, this is the point I wake him, I move him. Or, to be honest, you, you jump out of the bed and you go and sleep in the spare bedroom. You know, yeah, some, true. People, some, people are, some people are braver than others. Uh, so, you know, um, it's perfectly safe to wake someone. It's a pretty good idea to wake someone if you can tell the build-up. I would always, you know, believe a, a very sensible bed partner in a long marriage about that. There's no danger to that. There's more really danger does, to it, it, untreated. It really does highlight how this can be a two-person problem. You know, oh, you sure. two people not sleeping well. Yeah, there's, uh, right. there's two for the price of one in a sleep clinic. Yes, I'm, I'm sure. Um, why don't we move to the next slide? So while most folks on this webinar are probably familiar with this message, join the study that can change everything. Let me take a minute to update anybody in our audience who are not familiar with this. The Parkinson's Progressive Markers Initiative, or what we call PPMI for short, uh, is the foundation's landmark study that is um, trying to identify a biomarker for the progression of Parkinson's disease. 
And this study has the real potential to change the way PD is diagnosed, managed, and even prevented. But in order to do this, thousands of recruits are needed. And this important study needs all of us to contribute, to help out. And believe it or not, there is a place for everyone on this webinar to help because the PPMI needs people with Parkinson's and people without Parkinson's. And for those who are even unable to travel to a research center or don't have a research center nearby, there is now an online component for anyone who's over 18 and living in the United States. They are, hope to, they are hoping to soon recruit people from other, be able to recruit people from other countries as well. And of course, they're recruiting folks with specific symptoms, including those with sleep disorder issues. Um, so we can get to the finish line if each of us steps up to run a leg in this race. And so my call to action is to click that Get Started button that's on your screen today and to be a part of something bigger than yourself um, by helping out and joining the PPMI. Um, Ralph, uh, I mean, uh, Otis, you are uh, a part of the PPMI, are you not? Yes, I joined the PPMI uh, initiation. Uh, it was, wow, 10 years ago. Oh, you, first... you've been in the study for 10 years already? Yes. Great. And, and how has your experience been? I was curious when I was first diagnosed with the REM sleep disorder, and uh, I said that I was told that I had characteristics of uh, it may turn into Parkinson's. That was one of the reasons that I looked at it. And then if I could help find a solution, I'll be part of helping find a solution. I, it would make me feel good. And so uh, I joined the study. We did going to the doctor, taking dis different tests, uh, but basically just checking to see if my symptoms have changed or if they had grown more. Uh, and it's a long-term thing, but uh, we I, I see them twice a year now, so it's kind of boiled down and stuff like that. But it's been an experience of, me feeling more better about myself, but also knowing that it's helping to try to find a solution to Parkinson. That's true. And I, th I thank you as a person with Parkinson's. I thank you for your participation in this very important clinical trial. Um, so I encourage everybody to go ahead and get press that Get Started button, um, and get some more information, and to join us in our quest for the answers to this uh, problematic neurodegenerative disease. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So, um, Otis, as you look over this list, is there anything that you had to deal with that is not mentioned here, things that, are, that you think are exacerbating your problem? And you've talked about the things that you've changed to make a difference in your sleep, but I'm just wondering whether there's things that you noticed um, that if you did differently, you would, you would uh, have a better night's sleep. Uh, now, basically everything on this list is what you go through. Uh, you kind of set up your own formula of what works well for you. Uh, I do take melatonin. Uh, that helps me go to sleep, but it doesn't say that I stay asleep. Uh, I try not to uh, eat after a certain hour. I try to stay away from the stress. Uh, and uh, yes, everything on the list works. Those are the things that I use to keep me uh, halfway right because I still I still dream I still go through it uh, and I've noticed that when I break my routine is the times that uh, I escalate or the, the dreams get real vivid or if Linda's trying to wake me up I'll, I'll, I'll pull her into the dream and talk back to her and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, Dr. Anderson, I'm, I'm interested that there's this slide uh, does identify many of the common culprits, but can you talk a bit more about the effect of DBS that may have on sleep? Well, of course, that's a, that's a small number of people, isn't it? Um, you, you think about DBS, so, so two things. The very positive effect of deep brain stimulation is that you're going to get better motor control. It's a really small thing, but it's very uncomfortable to not be able to move normally at night during sleep. Um, you know, we don't think about the fact you're designed to move and roll over and turn every 15 minutes or so. And one of the things that people with Parkinson's say is they're just sore. You know, they're sore because they're stiff because sometimes the medication's wearing off. So you'd be hoping that people getting better motor control. Of course, DBS, we know for some people, if we look over time, can have an impact on mood and mood and sleep are absolutely intertwined. 
But overall, you're going to select people carefully and hope that the improved motor control is going to long-term give a beneficial effect on sleep, sometimes set against evolving worsening sleep, sometimes coming with worsening mood for some people. And what, what about the side effects of medications, especially like the dopamine agonists? I mean, I have plenty of friends who with people with Parkinson's who are on dopamine agonists that keep them up late at night, three hours, being able to, you know, not say goodnight to their phone, their tablet, their laptop, um, behavior that takes, you know, wants to take on one more brain game or the next episode of their favorite Netflix show. You know, what's going on there that... Um, yeah, so I don't think that's really interesting because, of course, they use less now. So two main market dopamine agonists obviously a licensed therapy for Parkinson's disease but as people may well know they're also a licensed therapy for restless leg syndrome in fact they would be considered you know a gold standard treatment very good research trials but one of the big problems we increasingly recognize is that the dopamine agonist as a drug can make you impulsive and you right. can have somewhat obsessive repetitive behaviors that can be minor but it can feed into those checking behaviors close at night. One more thing, one more thing, back on phone. So that's that's a small thing. Having said that, certainly some people, when they first start dopamine agonists, say that they feel quite sleepy. And for a while, people thought that sleep attacks were a big problem with these drugs. I'm not sure I have seen that or we've seen that on our research. I think it's probably more often that we recognize the higher doses of the drugs can lead to behavioral change and the behavioral change is what's stopping sleep onset. And I don't know what feedback you've had from your friends using them about which of those things. If on the other hand, you, you, you have quite nasty restless legs, it might be quite good medications. You need to stand back and look at the person and look at, look at their tablets thinking about the day, but also thinking about the night and what their sleep problems might be before you prescribe them. Um, okay, and what about um, things like, um, well, let's, maybe we should just go ahead and move to the next slide. We can talk about managing things. So, um, Dr. Anderson, can you start us off uh, with what constitutes good sleep hygiene? Yeah, sleep hygiene's a, a, a rotten word, isn't it? It makes it sound like you've got to yeah, wash it is. before you go to bed. It's a terrible word. But what it actually really means is just understanding a bit a bit about about how sleep works and about how you know the day works. So it's the behaviors, the things you do during the day, the things you do at night that are going to make you sleep well. Um, being out every day and being active every day sounds that it's something that's nothing to do with sleep, but it's an enormous part of sleeping well at night. We're designed to be out, we're designed to move. One of the things that the lockdown told us is that most people had a little bit of trouble settling when they were really restricted and couldn't go out and couldn't move as much. If you think about sleep itself, very, very simple, small rules. The bedroom should be cool, dark and quiet, and that's it. Actually, I don't overcomplicate life. If you bring your daytime world into your bedroom, make it the place that you do all of your work and sit on your phone and, and, and take those really stressful late night emails, then really your brain doesn't quite know what's the day and what's the night. So really simple, cool, dark, quiet, take everything else out of the bedroom. Um, there's not much more to it. Uh, there really isn't. Sometimes there's very, very long checklists of stuff, but I, I tend to go, Go to bed when you feel sleepy. That sounds like a really stupid instruction. But some people go to bed two hours earlier than they're sleepy because the other person they're with goes to bed at a different time and pretty much get up at the same time every day-ish. I mean, it's not a hard and fast line, but setting that sort of anchor point that you kind of get up when you wake up is, is, is good advice. Um, and, you know... Long marriages or short marriages, if you're lying in bed really cross about something, it's not a good idea to keep it in the bedroom. <laughs> Go and take that somewhere else as well. Okay. Uh, and, and is exercise something helpful that people can do? And if they do, should they do it before bed or stay away from that time period? Okay. So, so I, I love exercise. Uh, I, I like exercising, but I love exercise for my Parkinson's patients because it's really important to have something that you can do which you, you, know, you really feel is rock solid science and it's good for everything. You know, we know that there is good data to show that out of breath exercise is, is good for Parkinson's disease. 
but it's pretty good for everything. So if you do out of breath exercise, anything that you enjoy, I'd probably say activity, do something that you like that gets you out of breath every day. As long as you do that, not just before bed, you know, probably not in the one or two hours before bed, Otherwise, stick it where you want, really. You know, it's much better to do it than to worry too much about the timing. So, no, I wouldn't be hitting the gym really late at night and then getting into bed, you know, all, all full of adrenaline. But exercise is, is fantastic for sleep. And it's good for Parkinson's. So that you, you've got two for the price of one there. I love, I love this exercise that gets you out of breath. People always <clears throat> want to know about how much of the exercise. And, boy, that one, that little caveat kind of sort of sums it up. Um, 20, where, 20 you 30 know, minutes of something you enjoy that gets you out of breath. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't do something you hate. Look, mm-hmm. if, you, if you like walking, pick up the pace. If you're someone who likes crazy gym things, do that. I, I don't care and I don't mind. And the research shows it makes very little difference. I suppose if we were thinking about Parkinson's and about good control of walking, there's maybe a little more evidence for treadmill than other things, but it's really small. If you're talking about sleep, it doesn't matter. Get out of puff doing something you enjoy. It's good for sleep. Great. And can you speak about the use of medications for um, for sleep disorders, like clonazepam and melatonin? Yeah, I'm a big fan of melatonin, so I, I'm, I'm glad Otis is on that. That would have been my first go to drug. So melatonin is really interesting. So naturally occurring hormone, um, your pineal gland within your brain produces this. So it, melatonin has two, three jobs really, I suppose, in the Parkinson's clinic. I heard it just gets you off to sleep a little. And it might be that you also act out the dreams a bit less. Certainly some people will say things, yeah, good, we've got a nod. And mm-hmm. I would actually push the melatonin up in someone with REM sleep behavior disorder I would use quite high doses because it's just so safe. This is a Can drug. You give us what that would be. Yeah, ten, twelve milligrams. Yeah, oh. very good question. So I would I would go up to at least ten or twelve milligrams very comfortably, and I would really strongly reassure the patient this is a safe drug. You know, people want to know they're not taking things they're going to get hooked on, or they're going to it's going to wear off. If it works, it works, and it usually stays working. Um, so so. We've got to be very straightforward about drugs that don't have um, a really big randomized controlled trial. You'd find most sleep specialists would put people on melatonin first line, but we know that there aren't really big, good quality randomized controlled trials to guide that. These are just big case control studies. Clonazepam, I would use second line because it can make you feel a bit groggy in the morning. And if you're a bit older, if someone's in their 70s or 80s, it will, it will increase the risk of falls at night but it's certainly effective to decrease REM sleep behavior disorder. If I was thinking about insomnia without acting out dreams, I'd much prefer a behavioral strategy. I I would not want to use drugs first line if possible. I try and get them doing things right during the day and the night first. So what do you recommend when a person with Parkinson's has tried all of these management options but still is in a sleep deprivation mode? They're on melatonin, they're on clonazepam, they, they... they, they just can't find the right combination of things that will get them a good night's sleep. So I'm going to stand back and I'm going to say, it, it, is it one problem or more than one problem? So we've heard a lovely straightforward story of acting out dreams. We knew what it was. We've got a tablet. It's helped a bit. Not perfect, but it's better than it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. So, But what you're really describing, I think, is different, aren't you? You're describing someone, I think, agitated about the night. So I'm going to step back and say, what have I missed? Is there some sleep apnea there? Do I need to do a sleep study to look at the breathing? Is there some kicking restless legs? Have I got the nighttime drugs right? If all of that's been done and people aren't getting up five or six times at night to pee, getting up once at night to pee is is normal over the age of 45 or 50. Well, goodness, I hope it is because I do it. Uh, But getting up six or seven times, that's really disruptive. So you're going to treat all of that stuff If someone has just got a racing mind, they're just furious, they're chasing sleep, and then then I'm going to do sleep diaries and a behavioral strategy. So we step back and we say, write it down. Give me two weeks of sleep diaries. Then I'll look. 
And my, well, the diaries we use, which I'll share happily, um, they're day-night diaries. They really actually look at the 24 hours. They go back to, okay, let's actually look at the cup of coffee, the exercise, when you do it, when you're peeing, when you're eating, what time you're getting into bed, how much sleep it feels like you're getting, what time you're getting up and whether you're falling asleep. So we, we, we look at two weeks of data because when sleep's a mess, it's, it's really hard. You're just you're just frustrated and agitated and, and you forget what good sleep's like. So we write it down. Mm-hmm. Wow, that, that, that might make them so tired that they fall asleep. Perfect. <laughs> when, when. Okay. And this, yeah. a couple of small things. What you don't do is use your Fitbit or um, any other proprietary gadget. Uh, yeah. So what you don't use is use your, is, is use your watch. Um, a lot of, the, you know, we have some people come and say, I thought I was sleeping fine, and then my fancy watch told me my sleep was terrible. And I said, well, take your watch off, okay? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, that's the treatment. So your watch should be used for your daytime step count. We love it for that. It's quite good at picking out a, a big hands here, window for sleep. So I like the time it's off, you know, okay, it's off at, if it's off at one in the morning because you're doing too much uh, streaming TV, and it's, you know, you're, you're up at six, okay, you're not sleeping enough. But you take your watch off at night. Um, you only fill the diaries in once a day. People worry about filling in diaries, but it's your best recollection and you don't fill it in in the middle of the night because that's a really good point. You, you, you're saying that people might be too intimidated or not want to do the diaries. They're pretty effective. There's a good evidence base for doing this. That's great. Now, one of our audience members is asking if, um, if if they have a sleep difficulty, is that indicate a need to increase their, their carbidopa levodopa? It depends what the problem is. I mean, if, you know, if I was talking to, you know, to someone like Otis and he was saying he was acting out dreams more, I wouldn't be increasing the Parkinson's meds. I'd be increasing the melatonin, maybe even considering a second line drug. I'd be really looking at, again, going back to what the problem is. Is it pain? Is it stiffness? Is that what's keeping them awake? Then you might want slow release levodopa at night. but, But is it something else? You just go back to take a history go back and just listen to you know we've heard this beautiful story all i had to do was sit and listen i go okay i know what this is people will tell you and get the bed partner in as well really important for the bits that the person wouldn't know do you snore how do i know unless i sleep next to someone you go back and you you take the history and you work out what the problem is okay Um, so let's let's go to the next slide here which is what I think for those people dealing with sleep disorders really want to hear the most about, and that is, um, you know, what is the future of sleep care? What what should we um, be looking for down the line here that, that might be, you know, coming down the pipe, pipeline for improvement in sleep disorder problems? Really good questions. I suppose the things that have come out of COVID that have been good, and again, I might ask Otis, um, did your appointments switch to, to telephone or remote during the pandemic? Did your specialists do things, you know, not face to face out of interest? Uh, yeah, I would go in face to face once, and then the second one would be telehealth. Uh, we would do yeah. a, uh, Zoom and, or either, um, on the phone and stuff. So. And yeah, how did so, you find that? Was was that okay? Uh, it was okay for me because I use it myself. The, the hard part uh, about is checking uh, the neurological test of the hands yeah. and movement and the feet. I found yeah. that that was awkward sitting your laptop on the floor so you could see me walk down, uh, <laughs> walk down the hall and stuff like that. But uh, basically, though, uh, we're at a stage in the in in the study where those are the major things that they're looking at. And yeah. stuff. So me coming in once a year. Uh, for a face-to-face was 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 good enough at this part in the, at this time in the study. Yeah, so it's a really interesting perspective. So the stuff that we brought out of COVID is that not just sleep health and sleep monitoring, is that some stuff can be telehealth and some stuff, as you've just said, actually can't be. You're coming back to more personalized care. So some of the things that I think was really interesting in terms of studying sleep changes and how we can help people was how much we can do remotely. And I might go really simple with the commonest sleep disorder, which is sleep apnea and a CPAP machine. 
and the devices have just got better and better and better. And that was something that almost entirely went remote because, uh, and I mean, Otis, you sound pretty switched on with a lot of this testing, but someone like yourself, I would be giving you the device and you the app on your phone and you'd be telling me if there was any problem with your overnight breathing because you'd be good enough to do that. So I think some of the computerized medicine is really good for some of the sleep disorders. I think studying sleep changes, the big, the big block we have is that we still consider this gold standard sleep study coming into the sleep lab to make the diagnosis like REM sleep behavior disorder. And you know, it's can we do better? Can we do home monitoring? Can we do things that are less gadgets, less wires? Most people don't love the sleep study. They do it because they have to, and it's a lot of wires, and they don't sleep very well. It's quite artificial. Mm -hmm. I think in terms sorry. of test, sorry, we, I was, were you going to ask something there? Yeah, I was going to. I was going to ask you. I, I have a two-year-old granddaughter who they have a little baby monitor that monitor that can a camera that can you know watch her sleep and right in their house. So I'm not sure why we we can't do something similar for adults and to have just a small camera that just records a night of sleep in their own bed. Yeah, exactly. It's it's setting up um, uh, it, it's setting up standards to know it's as good as 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 the way yeah. we diagnose things at the moment. So that's happening quickly, and there's just lots of nice home gadgets that will just look at sleep. Lots of the research we do um, uses some version of actigraphy. Essentially, you know, a, a wristwatch with a with an accelerometer detecting various things, including light, to do population health studies. We know they're better than pen and paper sleep diaries. We know they're not quite as good as the sleep bag, but you can look at thousands of people and look at how sleep patterns change in time. You know, just like the PPMI study, we are picking out early morning, you know, early warning markers of good or bad aging. You know, my whole point about RBD is that I want to see people who act out their dreams so I can get them into really good shape. I can I can make sure they have good brain health as they get older. So I I think there's a lot of interest in how much you can use worsening sleep as as a biomarker of trouble coming in terms of another health problem. And for that, you use population-based things. And that's that's going to be things like, um, you know, whether it's an Apple Watch or something else. So these are amazing big population studies about can, can you pick out a high-risk population? Um, so that's probably studying sleep changes. In terms of testing new treatments, um, probably some of the biggest advances are coming in the stimulant drugs and some of the drugs that are coming out for conditions I treat like narcolepsy. So there's been some really exciting advances in some of these and some of the sleep weight drugs. We have we have more drugs to to you know give our patients better choice now than we did before. Um, and you know, in terms of community and learning from the community, one of the really nice things, whether it's this web or anything else, is you know I listen to bedtime stories for a living. It's a great job. So the best thing about our joined up big world is that we've got this 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 chance to 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 pick out pattern recognition because of all, all of the internet because of all of the things that we've sort of joined up in terms of that repository of patients telling us how can we learn from patients to pick out patterns so i think the big population studies like ppmi are absolutely vital um well, and that, that would include also um, the, the um, Fox Insight study, which is an online study that asks uh, Parkinson's patients and controls uh, questions about living with Parkinson's disease. Um, mm. And I think that those kind of sort of, um, those kind of large scale um, studies can pull together enough information from enough people that they can make some um, uh, clinical decisions based on what they should, you know, what somebody might be able to do to get some relief from some of their symptoms. Um, that's, I think it really gets Fox Insight, which is um, not the same online study that the PPMI is, but for people who are interested in, in, in participating in online research, it's a good place to, to add your voice. Um, somebody's asking um, whether diet matters or alcohol, the impact of alcohol on sleep, sleep problems. Okay, alcohol more than diet. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, you know, since Shakespeare wrote about it, we, we know what alcohol does. It makes you pee a little more, it makes you behave a little badly, and it makes you snore a little more. So it's an interesting drug. It's not great for REM sleep behavior disorder because 
actually because of the way it's metabolized your liver is really good at getting rid of alcohol so it's one of, it's a drug that tends um to be removed very quickly from the system so you you fall asleep a bit quicker but a bit lighter but as it comes out of you get rem rebound essentially about halfway through the night so if you have quite a lot to drink almost everybody recognizes that they'll have some slightly worse vivid sweaty dreams if you already have a dream sleep disorder then it will make it a bit worse so you know alcohol on the whole not to be used it's not a great sleeping tablet and it's it's not good if you have nightmares if you act out your dreams or if you snore loudly then i say have a glass of wine in the middle of the day but don't drink close to bedtime mm-hmm. i think sleep doctors care when you drink not so much what you drink and not too much and so speaking of drugs there's been several questions about cannabis and and its impact on sleep does it help I mean, cannabis, cannabis is an incredibly, it's not one drug. That's the first thing to say, isn't it? It's a whole mix of chemicals. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a compound, if you like, with uppers and downers in it. And it depends exactly what people are taking. And there'll be people who feel that it's relaxing and that they fall asleep easier. Um, if they have cannabis close to bedtime, you know, as you might imagine, that's not something I'm going to endorse or recommend, but people tell me that. Um, probably in the UK, we have a very large number of people who ask me about CBD. Um, so I'll, I'll probably do that because it seems nothing I treat. Uh, you know, I, I don't have, I can't think of a patient who hasn't asked me about CBD, whether it's their sore knee or their sleep or anything else. Um, most in the UK, most of the CBD that comes out of a health food shop it is such small quantities of active chemical, it's not going into the brain. So any benefit no. is a little more likely to be placebo. So I say what I say to everyone. If you want to spend your money on something, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna argue over it. Uh, I don't think it will do harm, but I don't know what's in it. There isn't at the moment research to say it helps. So I'll probably stick with, you know, what, what we know. If research emerges, we'll update ourselves. But, yeah, that, that's what I say if someone asks me about CBD. So I have a question here from Linda from the audience. Um, she, people want to know, is if you're nervous when you go to bed, and how do you relax and let go of the worry of the, that your partner may have an active night? Well, no, that's a, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Did they ask me? No, 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 let, I realize it's it's it just so much better question for you. I'll be completely yeah. quiet. Sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> the question is for the question is for Linda. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, am I nervous? I'm not, I guess, after all these years, I'm not ner- nervous that I'm thinking I'm not, but I think my behavior maybe shows that I am. Like they said, it it, it, it affects both of us. And as, as I'm listening and watching uh, in this webinar, I'm noticing how I have been affected by it. And um some of the things that you're speaking of, I'm like, maybe I should look into that a little more for myself because I, I do, I'm on guard. I feel like I'm always watching out. I don't want to get hit. I don't want to, you know, be harmed. So I'm a little apprehensive and probably not resting as well as I need to because I'm always on guard looking out. It's better over the years. It's gotten better as he's gotten a little better taking the melatonin. I know he's not as violent as he used to be, but he still has episodes and they're not as bad as they used to be. But still for me, I'm still kind of sort of on guard. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'm okay. It, It doesn't uh, it's not like a big concern, but it is still something there that kind of lingers to make, let me know to be still a little, you know, not getting, I don't think, 100% of what I need to get right. as far as sleep. So trying to relax and not worry is, is takes up, you know, a bit of your day. I'm sure that the anticipation is, uh, over the years, has gotten better, but it's just it never goes away once you know that it's the possibility. Yeah, I would say that, and like I said, it's better, but it's still, you know, I, it's something I, I just do. I guess I've gotten used to it over the years. I, I can't imagine, Dr. Anderson, what happens when you have a couple who are both dealing with with REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, 
I always think um, how impressive and, and how well people cope with it, because actually the majority of people are as calm and straightforward as, as, as we hear the two of you today. They work out perfectly well that it's not the person's fault, that the stuff that makes it better, but almost everybody tells me that it's bubbling under the surface like that. I think that's a really nice description, very typical. And there's people who, in all honesty, decide that they will sleep separately. There's a lot of people will say, well, no, it's really important to us for lots of other important reasons that, that we share a bed. Those are very personal decisions. But you're absolutely right. A bit like, um, you know, a new mum with a young baby that's being on guard. You're, you're listening in there. Right, I think that's, right. You always have one ear open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is like that. Um now, you know, people, we've talked about needing a little less sleep as you get older and everybody wakes, it's normal to wake. But I think that experience is really common. As I said, you know, we are treating two people in the clinic for sure. Um, and is somebody's asking whether restless leg syndrome is related to RBD? No, it, well, okay, so the reason I said it's a sleep study is a really important is because there are mimics when somebody says that they're twitching, particularly if there isn't a really good bed partner who can give you that lovely, clear story, I absolutely have patients who have both on their sleep study. They, they twitch and they kick. Um, it's certainly true that someone with REM sleep behavior disorder has a slightly more restless night. But I would think of them as and treat them as two separate conditions. They're both just common. And again, restless legs gets, gets a bit more common as, as you get a little bit older. Um, so, so no, I, I would think of them and treat them as separate, really. Great. Well, it looks like we've used up all of our time here. Um, I want to thank you again for being part of our community. I'm sorry about the glitch we had with my computer, um, but I'm thanking you for joining us today. And thanks to our panelists for sharing your time and your expertise. We'll be sending a link to the webinar on demand uh, to listen to again or share as you'd like. We hope you find it helpful. If you're interested in supporting the Michael J. Fox Foundation and helping fund research toward a cure, there is an icon you can click on at the bottom toolbar of your screen that leads you to a page where you can donate. This is Karen Jaffe. I'm signing off, thanking you, and having a great day, and hopefully a great night tonight. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.